This is a CNA special report, The Gender Balance, an examination of the issues confronting women. Next, a look at sex crimes, the subject of more than 9,000 police reports between 2017 and last year. But that could just be the tip of the iceberg. Shame, fear of retaliation, and the victim's belief that they brought this upon themselves are some reasons why sex crimes remain underreported despite rising awareness. Li Liying has been speaking to two victims who came forward. 36-year-old Elizabeth Teo still bears the scars of an emotionally abusive relationship that happened when she was 19. The man was 20 years older than her. She saw him as a spiritual mentor and he took advantage of that. Elizabeth alleged that for three and a half years, he would abuse her in his car almost every day. He would pry my lips open with his tongue and then explore my oral cavity and kiss me very, very heavily. And he digitally penetrated maybe, maybe maybe three, four times. And I remember one of the incidences was in a heavy duty car park just like this up at East Coast Park. How did all of these eventually end? Uh, he, his conscience got the better of him. This was one fine day, he, he made a decision and says, you are free to go. That I ran and I never came back. But the trauma never left. For over a decade, she stayed silent as she struggled with depression and suicidal thoughts. I blamed myself for the sexual abuse. That I didn't push him away hard enough, I didn't run away hard enough, I didn't say no loud enough. After a therapist helped her see it wasn't her fault, she finally made a police report in 2018. I don't know whether he has done it to any other girl. It really is about protecting other people too. After one and a half years of investigations, authorities decided not to take further action for the case. Police did not say why. While Elizabeth did not get the ending she wanted, another victim found closure by painting and with the criminal conviction for her assailant. The 22-year-old was sexually assaulted by her stepfather for six years, starting when she was just nine. Things came to light when she mentally broke down when she was 18, and the Institute of Mental Health referred her case to the police. When we first started the investigation, it was quite often like I had to go down. The more I told them, the more they questioned me. They also asked me how did my house look like. I remember having to draw down like a bird view of my room yeah, and where the bed was, where the door was. Eventually, the perpetrator pleaded guilty and was sentenced to 24 years jail. At the beginning of the process, I was very tired and I wanted to give up. In the middle, um, things were starting to look up for me because a lot of people were encouraging. I saw more light than darkness. The two cases give a sense of the challenges victims face when coming forward with their experiences. But other than shame and stigma, other survivors tell me that there's another obstacle that holds them back, not knowing what to expect when making a police report. I'm about to find out how the police do their work and whether the process is as daunting as it sounds. Hi, hello. One investigation officer is giving me an exclusive look at how the police tackle sex crimes. The reporting journey for victims can start at a neighbourhood police centre like this. Here, cases are sorted and potential offences that are heard in the High Court, like rape cases, are referred to the Serious Sexual Crime Branch. The department dealt with some 350 rape cases last year, 60% more than in 2018. This is the room where more in-depth questions are asked. Some of the questions that we ask during the course of the interview include questions on uh, the victim's attire, uh, as well as the perpetrator's attire. Yeah, so these questions are being asked for the purpose of identification and to match uh, with your CCTV footage as well as other circumstantial evidence. Mm -hmm. Other questions that we ask include questions on the victim's uh, sexual history, yeah, uh, because uh, this is to allow our officers to have a better understanding when it comes to the interpretation of the results that we obtain from the reports of the forensic medical examinations. Mm -hmm. So while these questions uh, may be intrusive and appear intrusive and sometimes even victim blaming yeah, to the victim, uh, we do want to seek the victim's understanding that these questions are still necessary for police investigation. Our questions um, do not impute any uh, responsibility yeah, to the victims for the sexual crimes that have been committed against them. 
And time is of the essence for victims whose assaults had happened in the 72 hours prior to reporting. Forensic evidence can still be collected. And victims can be attended to at this centre called One Safe, located within Police Cantonment Complex. As of July, it has been used about 180 times. Okay, over here is what we have, what we call trace evidence. Mm. So this trace evidence is actually a bound piece of paper whereby the victim will be asked to stand on the paper and remove uh, his or her clothing. So what happens is that any debris that is on the clothing or even uh, from uh, the genital area all will fall on this uh, bound piece of paper and be packed inside this bound envelope. So other than trace evidence, we also do collect the victim's uh, clothing mm. as well. So we have uh, various uh, bound envelopes okay, mm. to pack all the various uh, pieces of clothing individually. Yes. Then what happens after um, the victim's clothing is collected? We do have apparels uh, and uh, extra clothing available yeah, for the victims to change into. Um, so basically over here are basically uh, swab tubes okay, that the examining doctor will use to take various intimate uh, swabs. Yeah. Okay. So over here we also have a urine bottle yeah, as well as uh, blood tubes. So the purpose of this is actually um, to test uh, for toxicology yeah, because as uh, some uh, victims uh, might have been uh, intoxicated uh, during uh, the course of the sexual assault. Uh, the police do encourage uh, such victims to come forward to report the matter to the police. And this is regardless of when the incident happened mm. or even if the victims are of the view that they may not have sufficient evidence um, to, to prove the case. Yeah. Uh, because at the end of the day, it's the duty of the police to establish the required evidence and uh, to try to uh, find out the truth. The time taken for police to investigate each case depends on its complexity and seriousness of the assault. But whether the case goes before the courts, now that's something the police will have to discuss with the Attorney General's chambers. By its very nature, sexual crimes are often committed in private or isolated settings, and there are often no eyewitnesses to the event. A court can still convict the accused if the judge is satisfied that the victim's evidence is unusually convincing, whether the victim's account is consistent with other pieces of evidence that have been produced in court. So for example, psychiatry reports, reports to the gynecologist. When a case is reported quite some time after the incident, it is more difficult to prosecute the case Although, I should stress that it is not absolutely fatal to a successful prosecution. We still treat the case like any other case that's reported, say, one day after the incident. The same evidential thresholds will apply.